and welcome to our annual Halloween thrifting spooktacular. Of course, I use the term spooktacular incredibly loosely. I mean, let's face it, most of the scares from my visits to the thrift stores come from the condition of the stuff, not the stuff itself. And otherwise, admittedly, the thrifting part of the equation didn't really hold up this time. So it's not for lack of trying. I mean, I started on this back in late August, early September, but I just wasn't finding much. So here's the breakdown. We are going to hit up five stores this time around, but only the first two are normal old thrift stores, and admittedly one of those segments had to be stitched together out of multiple visits. So after that we're going to take just a quick visit to, I guess my favorite local record store, subject to change, and then the entire second half of this video will be me just giving up altogether and just hitting up those annual pop-up Halloween specialty novelty type stores and making fun of all the dorky costumes and decorations and such. And yes, that is the best material of this episode. Well, let's kick things off at Goodwill, or, uh, I don't know, maybe the crap casino in the mirror reflection might be better. No, 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 no. This is supposed to be a thrifting expedition. All right, let's go in. This was all too representative of the Halloween stuff this year. I don't know, maybe it's because we've had just a really long Indian summer this year and no one's in the mood for Halloween? Who knows? Come in for a spell, said the witch. Strangely enough, this bag smelled like a sweaty foot. Oh, oh, must be a sign from the Denver Tech Center. Can't make up its damn mind. Stay but don't stay. Go but don't go. Anyway, this section just keeps getting sadder, doesn't it? That fake ponytail looks more like an oversized marathon candy bar. And a, oh hey, a hat for my Yacht Rock Captain costume. And it's about six sizes too small. We hate to see you leaf. What acorn-y joke or something. Anyway, uh, here's the scariest thing in the store. Now, of course, several years ago, I rather infamously covered the Aroma Disc player. No sound, just really, really bad potpourri scents on little record-ish looking discs. And no, I am not covering this thing again. Well, I guess it was inevitable. The archive is now at least partially brought to you by Pfizer. Jokes aside, mixed in with the regular 45s were a stack of 7-inch 33s that... I guess go with some film strips put out by Pfizer back in the 60s, and apparently Pfizer was mostly agricultural at one point. And uh, yes, down there there was a rogue disc from Senex gas stations mixed in. And yes, I grabbed all of these, even the one duplicate. And the haul from this store consists of a total of six records, Four from Pfizer, and uh, really, uh, how could I say no to titles like High Level Feeds, or Control of CRD with Antibiotics, or beneath that my personal favorite, Profitable Beef Production. Otherwise, I got one from the Senex chain of gas stations, seemingly a radio commercial, and beneath that, found off camera, a record ripoffs candidate that I already own, but is in somewhat better condition than my existing copy, which is flat out unplayable. Moving back in time to a rainy Labor Day ish visit to Savers, with some later footage admittedly mixed in. And no, I did not steal a handicapped spot, it was the next one over from me. You can trust me. For no good reason, in the CDs, we've got 15 copies of Chicago's first Greatest Hits album, all still sealed. 
I already have most of the regular albums, so I really don't need this. A little farther down, a copy of Tears for Fears, The Seeds of Love album. Now, I already have a later, stupidly overcompressed version of this, but uh, yeah, apparently someone actually believed in the old marker around the edges trick, because, you know, it keeps the ones and zeros from falling out of the CD. Uh, yeah, I am not getting this copy, but I am getting this, Susie and the Banshees' second compilation of their singles, which I already have, but my case and artwork are kind of damaged and the disc is kind of scratched up, so this copy is way better than what I've got, especially the disc, which is pristine. But aside from that, yeah, there wasn't much of interest. Really, not much of interest in the vinyl today either. We got a KTEL compilation, Kenny Rogers album, but uh, yeah, there was one gem, Mrs. Miller's Country Album. Uh, look her up, kids. You won't regret it. Anyway, it's dusty, but otherwise in good shape. This album has never been on CD, and uh, yeah, I'm getting it. And nobody tell Shango or Radio TV Phono Nut that I have this. They'll just want to confiscate it and destroy it. Now here's one for the Pointless Inventions pile. A pen radio. It's a pen and an FM radio, all in one. I doubt I'd ever even get a Benz junk out of this thing, and I'm sure the cost of new batteries for this would way outweigh the value of the radio. Whew. I had totally forgotten what day Halloween was. But no, I am not paying $5 for that bit of info savers. Sorry. Otherwise, uh... You know, I think that spider might be dead. Okay, I really have no idea if this doll is intentionally creepy or not. For a second there, I thought someone had the good sense to make a Count Floyd plushie. Uh, scary 3D, kids. But uh, no, this is apparently supposed to be a cool vampire with his sun glasses. Why? And his Walkman. Apparently it makes noises too, but there's no batteries in there to test, and I don't know what the hell is wrong with me, but yes, I'll pick it up. Yeah, this has been my reaction to all the Halloween stuff this year. Alternately bemused and bewildered. And uh, yeah, apparently the one on the left lost its stem, and that somehow makes it worth almost twice as much. Because thrift store logic. And the haul from this store consists of the not-quite-Count Floyd plushie, which was actually initially from a Goodwill. But yeah, it takes batteries and it plays the world's lamest rap. I'll play it later. Aside from that, we got three CDs, Susie and the Banshees' second singles compilation, an upgrade from my existing copy, a truly awful-looking, probably local demo from a group presumably called Little Man, and a copy of Night Ranger's first album. Because why not? Otherwise, two records, a fairly early Tops LP for the record ripoffs pile, and of course, the true gem of the lot, the country soul of Mrs. Miller. And here's where the thrifting thing fell off the rails. So I shot this on Columbus Day. I was going to go to the pawn shop next door, but they decided it was apparently a major enough holiday to be closed. So instead, let's hit up the used record store next door. In the new arrivals, a lot of metal, save for a Stray Pretenders album, but the noteworthy thing was from the Gorehounds. But not our Gorehounds from earlier this year. This is the original Irish The Gorehounds from the 80s. And no, I was not curious enough to pick it up. Well, apparently Leo Kotke is jazz now. Anyway, they had a copy of his third album. 
And this one was released on a tiny local label and was also competing with his own then new second album. Anyway, this thing has never been on CD and this is an original copy. But the thing is, this album is really not sought after. I mean, you can pick this up on Discogs for about 10 bucks at any given time. This store wanted 18 bucks for it. The regular used CDs here are flat priced at $8 a pop, which can be fantastic at times. Case in point, Glenn Fry's first solo album, which fetches around 40 bucks on the collector's market as of my making this. I've already got this one on cassette, but I've never transferred it, and uh, yeah, they keep the discs behind the counter here. As far as I'm concerned, a pretty good haul this time. Fairport Convention's Babacom Lee, which admittedly can be had used for 8 bucks normally, but all too often without the slipcase. Then, uh, more than enough half-Japanese to last a lifetime. This usually fetches around 20 bucks used these days. And lastly, the Glenn Fry album, which, as I mentioned, usually fetches around 40 bucks these days. And I only just realized what kind of stylistic whiplash I've given you in the last two minutes. My deepest apologies. Picking back up right after a quick lunch break, and we're at Spirit of Halloween. Or, uh, Spirit Halloween? Stupid Mandela effect. Well, you know, tombstones have gotten so gosh darn expensive anymore that, yeah, whenever the day comes, I'm probably gonna have to settle for a Halloween novelty stone. And, uh, hey, there you go. The formless human figure from the movie adaptation of Pink Floyd's The Wall. But just legally different enough, of course. And otherwise, uh... Ooh, scary DC adapter, kids. Thing from the Adams Family, also just legally different enough, though. Hey, that's where my spine went. Now if I could just find my orange crush. And I can't resist. Guess what I'm doing? Yes, a spinal tap. Otherwise, uh, it kind of looks like the dumpster behind a KFC, doesn't it? Oh, hey, one of those crappy platitude decorations that I can finally get behind. And of course, this being the year of the Beetlejuice sequel that nobody asked for, we've got merchandise. And yes, those two books are just empty journals. And ah, uh, boy, they did Gina Davis dirty with that puppet, didn't they? And the mermaid lady from Pee-wee's Playhouse, I think. Anyway, uh, here's an example of licensing run amok, and not to mention bad taste. The Halloween 2 variant of Michael Myers, for your kid. So in other words, Universal Studios owns the rights to Halloween 2 and 3, but only number 2 truly features Michael Myers. And on that note, a Halloween 2 costume for your small dog. Ain't that America? That dog looks far more evil without the scream mask. Well, every year this chain has some sort of loose motif going. This year it's Carn Evil. Not Carn Evil 9, and certainly not with a K. You know, because Emerson, Lake, and Palmer might sue, or at least some of their estates. Anyway, 270 bucks for a clunky, clanging spider toy that would disappear in a heartbeat in my neighborhood. Anyway, uh, shall we see the show? Okay, so it's the same with or without the, uh, admittance fee. Otherwise, uh... Boy, I don't remember this scene from Killer Clowns from Outer Space. So sad I even know that movie. Anyway, that gun is aimed right where I want it. 
but somehow I fear there won't be festive clown bits plastered to the back wall when I'm done, though. But nonetheless, let's see what happens when I shoot the clown crotch. Oh, oh, that's lame. I have to hit both buttons. Really? Maybe his sunflower glasses saved him. And on to the smaller but often more fun Halloween Express. Now, the word on the street is that since the Tuesday morning, uh, kind of a Pier 1 import sort of thing, next door went under, Halloween Express is far larger this year. And indeed, it is far larger. Really, prior to this year, it was just a super narrow two-aisle store. I will never understand the whole intentionally creepy doll thing. Because, you know, as we all know, even the most wonky old dolls already had psycho killer eyes and woefully mismatched body parts. Yeah, I don't claim to be a huge horror expert, but yeah, it's just dumb, isn't it? Anyway, behind that, and uh, get out of my way, we've got a uh, skeleton fogger. Which, I guess, if the lighting is just right, makes it look like the skeleton is letting out the ultimate popcorn fart. Dare I admit that back in my staging days, if we had someone come through the venue that was being a true asswipe, we would induce asswiping by trying to get their hands, and by turn eyes and or mouth, into some fog juice. And if you know the ingredients of fog juice, you know my choice of words there was 100% appropriate. Oh hey, it's Craig's brother Jeff. A little deep cut for the true archive nuts. Anyway, how rude. Not to mention the ludicrous length of that finger. So rude. Anyway, today I learned that my last name is dangerously close to the French word for handcuffs. You know, I've heard that if you say rubber chicken three times while holding a rubber chicken... Sven Gulli will appear. And yes, I tried it, and, and no, it didn't work. I didn't even get Kerwin, his prehistoric rubber chicken sidekick. While I appreciate the reference, if I know my Halloween lore well enough, no home sold by Strode Realty was ever a problem. Only the Strode's own home. Well, since this episode has long since devolved into a long line of bad jokes, let's just run with it. I guess he could add a warhead to the costume we just saw below, and then it could be an S-bomb to go with the F-bomb. And uh, since we're running with scatological humor here, here's one for an especially deranged couple. And uh, yeah, I do see that official licensed Sharknado costume back there. And uh, oh hey... I can say pussy magnet in this episode and get away with it, because it means cats. Get it? I love technicalities. Ugh, oh please. That cassette costume should have mangled tape running out the side, and the boombox one should just be one huge dent. And, uh, you know, I don't play live, but if I did... I'd give an audience member 50 bucks just for showing up in one of those costumes. Dare I enter? Yeah, let's go. Well, uh, it looks like the cast of a really bad musical. Oh, hey, it's the main course for dinner tonight. Save me a thigh. Oh, here's the real scary part. 300 bucks for a mangy rat. You know, not but two years ago, it was half that. Man, none of this is all that scary. Actually, it looks more like my grandparents' attic than anything else. Gah! Ah, evil tree. Oh, shut up. And the final haul for this episode consists of three LPs, 
two fairly early record ripoffs candidates, and the country soul of Mrs. Miller, which has never been reissued, and I can't imagine why. Otherwise, five seven-inchers, one from Senex gas stations, and four from Pfizer to go with some film strips of theirs that were, alas, nowhere to be found. Then we have a total of six CDs, Fairport Conventions, Babacom Lee, Half Japanese, Greatest Hits, <laughs> hearty har har, Glenn Fry, No Fun Allowed, Susie and the Banshees, Twice Upon a Time, Night Ranger, Dawn Patrol, and Little Man, I think. Oh yeah, and the not quite Count Floyd plushie. And the cost of this haul came out to about 50 bucks, half of which was the first three CDs. And that's it for this installment of Archive Thrifting. I'll talk to you again soon. next way working hand in hand Senex is the country way sharing